So, with no further ado, we're going to have Ted, who's given you know, like, huh, half a dozen talks in the club, give yet another one for 3D printing. Let's take it away, Ted. Okay, great. So, uh, many of you in the club know me. Many of you who are in here, I still have faces I don't know. My name is Ted Larson, and uh, I love robots, just like everyone else in the room does. And, yeah, woohoo! <laughs> and um, I really like robots that make things. Like, uh, I recently took a class over at the tech shop to learn how to use the shop bot, which is this 3D, it's this giant 3D CNC machine that can cut plywood and make furniture and things like that. And the reason I like it is because it's a robot that can like make stuff, okay? So I would much rather sit on a piece of furniture that was cut out by a robot than I would just that some guy made in his garage or whatever. So I really like any kind of a robot that can make another robot. So that's kind of what my theme is here. And um, what I'm gonna do is I brought a 3D printer that I'm gonna show off and we're gonna talk about that later in the talk. But what I thought I would do immediately, when I flip back to the thing, is I'm going to draw a very quick CAD drawing in SolidWorks, and which is a, a very expensive CAD program, which there are many other CAD programs you can use for making 3D models of things. This is just the one that I use at work. But I'm going to draw a little 3D object in here, and we're going to render it, and we're going to stick it in the printer, and we're going to print it out while I'm talking. So then at the end, you're going to get to see the, how quick and easy the process can be. Now, let's say that I wanted to make something, I don't know, just like a simple box or, you know, I don't know, whatever we're going to do. Uh, I could make a square with a, with a cube or the, with a thing in the middle of it. You know, it, it goes pretty quick. And I could mention it up and we'll say, oh, we'll make this little box, you know, two inches by two inches. And then, uh, we're going to extrude it and turn it into a box. So make it, I don't know, an inch high. Okay, so there's our little box. And let's say that we wanted to put a little thing on the top of the box that was, uh, you know, a little cylinder or something. Uh, we can sketch a little cylinder on the top of the box. And then uh, we can make the cylinder, I don't know, half an inch in diameter. Oops. Like, like five. Okay, and then uh, we can exit it and extrude it, and we can make it, I don't know, 25, oops, like a half an inch. So now we're gonna make a box with little cylinders sticking out of the top of it. So there we are, there's our part. Pretty, pretty not so great, but hey, it's just a demonstration, right? So then what I can do is I can save, take this part and I can save it away, and the format that most people use for 3D printing is an STL file. So we're going to save this as an STL file. And then, there it goes. We're saving it. And then we're going to pull it into another program. Once you have your 3D model and you've drawn your thing that you want to print out, you need to pull it into another program, which in the computer manufacturing world where things are cutting things out or whatever, they call it CAM, which is Computer Aided Manufacturing, which essentially is a, uh, a program that takes your 3D drawing and turns it into something that a machine can actually execute or work with. So in this case, there's an open source program that I'm gonna use, it's called Replicator G. It's a CAM package that allows me to pull my 3D model in, render it, and then make it so that I can pump it into the printer and print. So in this case, you can see I was printing like a, a piece of a gripper or something there. Uh, but I'm going to pull in our new thing that we just made, and you're going to get to see, here's the part, here it comes, and there's our part, and we're all good to go. So now at this point I can render it for the printer, and we're going to render it like that, and we're going to make it not a lot of infill. Now what's interesting too is when you're doing this thing, when I'm generating this box, this program will automatically fill in the inside of the solid object with a honeycomb pattern. So it's not perfectly solid inside. It's actually very lightweight and, you know, interestingly takes up a lot of the space. So I don't end up having to use a lot of plastic in order to print the part. So in this voice I'm saying I'm going to fill it in with an 8% infill. The layer height of the printing is going to be 
0.2 millimeters each layer, and I'm going to go in 100 millimeters a second to print it. This all seems kind of Greek, maybe, at some point, but you'll see, we'll learn a little more when we talk about 3D printing and that kinds. And at this point, it's going to render it, and then I'm going to stick it on an SD card, I'm going to shove it in the computer, and it's going to start printing while we're while we're talking about 3D printers. That's, what a better way to talk about 3D printers than to have a 3D printer printing in the background while you're talking about printers. I thought that was kind of cool. But this, this step usually takes the longest. The bigger the part, the longer it takes to render, and you know, the longer it takes to print, obviously. Something that takes up the entire build volume of this printer could take 10 or 12 hours to print something. A typical object about this size should take about 45 minutes. So. Uh, but it's taking forever to render. Well, uh, we'll give it a moment here. We'll go back over to the uh, PowerPoint here and start talking while it's rendering in the background. All right, so, uh, so we're going to talk about what, are, what is 3D printing, what are the types that are out there. I wanted to kind of, I could give an exhaustive list. There's a million of them, and there's a million things that are related to it, things like 3D scanners and 3D things that you could use. It. I'm not going to cover all that, but I'm just going to try to give you a basic overview of the really high-end stuff, all the way down to the really low-end stuff, and then the stuff that I like to fiddle with, which is generally printing on a budget, which is my favorite thing to do. Uh, whoop. Oh, I hate this. Okay, so what is 3D printing, right? 3D printing tech, overview, and printing robot parts. Okay, here. Here are the various types of 3D printers that exist in the world. Uh, there is something, an extrusion printer, which is, it takes plastic and it jams it through a nozzle, and you end up with a very thin filament that you basically build it up in little tiny layers. That's called FDM, or fused deposition modeling. The types of plastics that you use in that are plastics that can be heated up and squeezed through some kind of an extrusion device. And uh, so the most popular ones are things like ABS, PLA, nylon, they do it to HDPE. Um, then the next kind is um, wire, which is electron beam freeform, which is 3D metal printing. They actually can take and, and uh, take metal, uh, little tiny metal shavings or beads and fuse them together with an electron beam and slowly build them up. And then you end up with this bath of powder with your metal thing inside the bath of powder and you can pull it out when it's done. And it's slowly melted together tiny little layers of metal. Uh, very similar is this granular type which is SLS. Um, they do a similar thing except they use a, a laser to basically they'll have a big box with a bunch of little particles in it and they'll use a laser to slowly fuse them together in the box and build it up layer by layer. Uh, Powder-based inkjet is something that's been around for a long time. Um, and these are printers where, again, you have a big box, you put a bunch of powder in it, and you s use a, uh, a print head like off of a, an inkjet printer, and it runs over the top, and then slowly sprays like a, some kind of a, uh, a binder, some kind of a, a glue out of the print head onto this powder, and then while it's spraying out onto the powder, it can spray inks onto the powder and color it. So you can end up with like full, you know, full color prints that come out of the thing. But then the surface quality, I'll show you, ends up being kind of, you know, rough and granular. I have samples of a lot of these kinds of things. I'm going to pass them around and you guys get to hold them in your hand. Let's see if our, uh, if our thing is done. Oh, it's ready. Okay, so now uh, I'm ready. I can shoot it off to the SD card here. And then I can pull the SD card out of the printer. And it's just like, you know, a camera or something. So then I'm going to just, I'm going to copy my part to the SD card. Uh -oh. Okay. Yeah. Yes. You may, yes. So, um, uh, let's see, why is this not working? Of course, of course it doesn't work when I want to give a demo. It's just part of the story. Yeah. So, um, Brian here is passing around some of the parts, and uh, you can check them out. Uh, there's two little wrenches that are in the parts that are being passed out. They are actually functional operational wrenches. So, um, 
be careful when you're dealing with it because I borrowed them and I don't want to bust them. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. Is it going to work now? Let's see if it's working now. Well, my little. There we go. I got it. Oh, it's in there. Good. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Demos never go the way that you think they're going to go. There it is. Okay. So it's going. So uh, give it a moment here. It'll get started. Let's see if it's going to go really quickly here. Okay. And usually when it prints one of these things, the first hardest part of it is laying down this first kind of layer of printing. But you can't really see it's kind of blown out on the screen, but it looks like it's starting out. It's off to a good start. Okay, so we'll let that run. And then by the end of my talk, we'll have a, a part, which is pretty exciting. Okay. Right. Okay, so there are many professional 3D printers on the market. You just put a file in there and you print it out and most of the time it comes out perfect. Hobby grade 3D printers on the other hand, they don't. You have to tinker with them and fiddle with them. That's the reason why they're really expensive ones. They produce really great results and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this is the premier, very expensive printer on the market. It's called the Object Eden. It prints using a UV curing print process. So they have a resin that they put in, they lay down, and they, they slowly build it up uh, by curing it. Uh, in this case, I don't know if this one uses a laser or what it uses inside, but it cures it. And it can print in three colors, and it's relatively slow. Uh, and it, because of the way that it prints, it takes just as long to print something big as it takes to print something small. Um, but you end up with these phenomenal print results. There's one of the wrenches that's being handed around uh, over there. Actually, it says object on the side of the wrench. One of them does. That's the one he's got up here. And you, you'll see when you're touching it, it's really beautiful. It's like the quality of the output is like something that you would get uh, if you were to injection mold a piece of plastic. It's very smooth and and it turns out there's mechanical working elements in the wrench that actually work, and they were printed in place. So it can actually print a mechanical working thing, and all you gotta do is, is pull it out, clean it off, and it works. Now, you say, well, what's the clean off thing? That's where most people argue about what the best 3D printer is. It's not about the printing, it's usually about what you have to do to the thing after you pull it out of the printer before you can actually do something with it. And in the case of the object, it uses a water jet. So you take a, you go, you stick your part in this little other machine that doesn't look like this, and you spray it with high pressure water, and any like supportive material that's in there, it's water soluble, it just kind of melts away. But people will argue that the object, Eden, even though it's a couple hundred thousand dollar printer, is not so good because you can't print really detailed, fine components, because when you put the water jet on it, it blows those away and then screws up your part. So, uh, the next one in the line is the ProJet. Now, uh, this one, uh, similar deal, uses a UV curing process. Uh, it prints in six colors, and it uses wax to support the material. And people say, well, what, what support material? So listen that I wanted to print a model of myself just standing with my arms out, okay? If I'm being built up from the bottom up, when I get to my arms, my arms are going to slump because I got this piece of plastic that's sticking out over here that's not being held up. So, a lot of these machines, what they'll do is they'll print supportive material to hold up the things that are sticking out so that they don't slump or break or fall off while it's trying to cure. And um, in the case of the Object Eden, they use a water soluble material that they lay down. In the case of the ProJet, they use a wax uh, type substance. And then their post process is you take the thing out of the printer and you put it in this oven like baking thing and it bakes the wax out of the inside. And um, uh, it is also very expensive, uh, but not as expensive as the object. There is a, uh, oh yeah, there is a part that's like part of a robot gripper that's being passed around. That was printed on a project. 
And um, the Willow Garage has a project. Yeah, and that's was one of the ones that was printed on Willow Garage as a project. Um, now, the next big one, this one's been around forever, okay, the Stratasys Dimension. This was kind of the first big, large scale FDM ABS printer. So it's, this is very similar to this little printer, except very, very expensive. It lays down a fine little filament of plastic that it extrudes and it slowly builds it up over time. And um, there is a orange iPod case that has my name on it that's being passed around back there, okay? That was printed on a Stratasys Dimension. And it was uh, one of the smaller ones. They used to have one at the tech shop, uh, but I don't think they have it there anymore. They got rid of it or they have some other printer there now. Uh, but that was printed on the tech shop's Stratasys when they had it. Uh, and their post-processing uh, thing is when they print support material, there's a plastic-like substance, substance called PVA, and it prints like plastic, but it's water-soluble. And that's the type of support material these guys use. And then you put your part in an ultrasonic bath, and then it vibrates the stuff out of the inside and moves the water-soluble material away from the part. And it also gives pretty good print results. But you can see when you're looking at the orange thing being passed around that it's got, you know, you can see the striation and the way that the, the part was printed. Um, then the last one, the last really expensive one is called a Z printer. And this one's been around again for a really long time. Um, this is a powder bed inkjet. This is the one that I'm talking about where you have a box of powder and it slowly builds up over time and it sprays the adhesive on using an inkjet like that. And literally when you're printing with this thing, when you're done, you literally pull your printed part out of this you know, pile of sand, essentially. And then you take it into another little chamber on the side where they have a little air jet and you blow off the powdered material that's left over and then you have this part. What you end up with is this really really kind of strange surface quality that feels like it's made out of glued together pieces of sand, okay? And uh, there's a little brown um, ball that's being passed around. That was printed on uh, the cheap version of this. And it has, uh, it basically feels like a bunch of sand that's been glued together. Now, this stuff has been updated and uh, they've made the, pr the printing process way better. That was maybe five years old, that part. They've made the printing process way better since they've, uh, and they've upgraded it. And you'll see there's another wrench that's being handed around that actually says Z printer on the handle. It's smaller. And you would never be able to tell that it was printed using the same printing process as that grainy block of sand glue together thing that's back there. Um, but these are all very accurate. They can hold their dimensional tolerances and things when you print. So if you print a hole that's a quarter of an inch in diameter, you, you get pretty close to a quarter of an inch in diameter and the hole isn't, it, the hole's generally round. What you'll find when we get to these cheap hobby grade printers, they can't print a round hole. It's always oblong or slightly misshapen or, or whatever, but that's what you, you're paying for. You're paying big bucks for that. Uh, so there's a lot of bureaus that own these high-end printers and you can send your design to them and they will gladly print it out and charge you money and send it to you. Um, Quick Parts is one of them. They have many 3D uh, printing techniques. Solid Concepts is a Z-Corp's printing bureau. So you send them a part, they print it out on a Z-Corp printer and then you get it back. Um, and then the most popular one that we've, a lot of people in the club have used, I've used it, is Shapeways. Uh, and uh, they, I'm not exactly sure what their process is, but, uh, but it's really high quality result and it's fairly inexpensive. I mean, you can get a part uh, about the size of that gripper that's being handed around for 10 or $15 printed for you. Um, I printed a robot, there's a full blown robot being passed around. It's like a green looking smartphone robot. There's a red one right there. He's, he's got it. Hold that up in the air. So I had one of those, a robot like that, that was printed on their service and it was about 75 bucks for all the parts to put one of those together. Uh, and then Pinoco is another popular place to go. These guys not only do 3D printing, but they do laser cutting. 
And they also have a glazed ceramic process where they can actually print in a glazed ceramic material. And it actually looks like ceramic tile. It's really cool. And then also some of these people, Shapeways I know, they'll also do SLS metal printing where they'll, they can print in metal and actually give you a 3D print of a metal part where it uses this, you know, little tiny beads of metal that they fuse together with a laser or in a bed and, um, and it ends up coming up. A lot of people use it for making jewelry. You'll see a lot of um, jewelry stuff, but there's a gazillion of these. All you have to do is go on Google and do a search for 3D Printing Service Bureau and you'll find page after page after page of companies that have a printer and they're just right now time on it to print stuff out. Are those last two URLs correct or they all say quick parts? Oh, whoops. Oh, well, that's no good. Okay, well, the, the, the next one is Shapeways. That's www.shapeways.com. And pretend the last one says www.pinoco.com. I'm sorry. Ah, I made a mistake. So, uh, my friend Dave Curtis, uh, I talked to him about buying a, a MakerBot once. And uh, he said, dude, you're not just buying a printer, you're making a lifestyle decision. And, and that is truly the case because. None of the printers I'm going to talk about in the hobby 3D category are you, you buy them, you set it up, you plug it in, you turn it on, and it prints just right out of the box. None of them do, and that's a common misconception, and it's also a source of pain for many people on the internet because they have to answer a lot of questions about why doesn't my 3D printer work like it was sold to me, it should work. So these are the, the two UV cure printing hobby printers that are on the market. Uh, the, they use a UV curing process. Um, the Form 1 is a Kickstarter project that was done uh, by some uh, MIT people and uh, it's been highly touted. They sold millions of dollars of printers through their Kickstarter. Um, and the B9 Creator is the blue one on the bottom. It, it also, uh, I don't know if it was on a Kickstarter or not, but they both sell now. You can buy them online. The Form 1's about $3,300 and the B9's about $5,000. It's very slow, but you get tremendously detailed finish quality and you can make really, really detailed tiny little pieces. Whereas with this kind of printing process, tiny little details just don't work uh, because of the process. And that's what a lot of people tout this for. You can make very, very detailed architectural models and things like that. Um, what they don't really tell you about when you learn about these things online is that the, the post process on these materials uh, is somewhat toxic and kind of nasty. Like you end up having to handle this UV cured epoxy resin and potentially infiltrate it with other materials in order to make it hold its shape. And, um, but one of the things I wanted to show, and again, I don't, I don't give it a high on my time. I don't even know when I started. Okay. So, um, whoops. Let's see if I can get that video to come on. I don't think I did it. Well, uh, well, my video doesn't want to work. Oh, maybe we'll show the video at the end if I can get it to come up. But they had this incredible video they did when they were doing the Form 1 printer, where the Form 1 prints by taking a, uh, a big tray of UV cure liquid, and it has this plunger-like thing that goes from the, from the top into the liquid, and there's a laser on the bottom that runs around and cures a, a very, very thin little layer of this UV-cured polymer, and then it slowly lifts up. So you end up with this video where there's this tray, and there's this thing lifting out of the tray, and it's like the 3D part is just appearing out of this bowl of epoxy resin, like ooze, and it's, it's the most amazing thing, their little video of it just appearing, of the part appearing out of a bowl of liquid, and it's just, it's, it's really mind-boggling. So, you know, let, let me try one more time here and see if I can get it to, get it to play. So, man, the, uh, hold on. Oh, there it is. Let's see if I can double click on this thing. Dang. Oh, yeah. Oh, control click. Okay, I'll try that. Control click. Is it going to work? Oops. That's not it. Ah. Uh, oh, there we go. Ah. 
Ah, there it is. Okay. So this was their Kickstarter. They raised almost $3 million for the thing. And um, let me, I'm going to skip to the part where they're printing with it. Here's the guy describing how cool it is. They're talking about all the great stuff you can make with it. Okay, here it is. Okay, so here they're using this UV cure light. And look at this. It's just appearing out of a, a tray of liquid. That is the most amazing thing to me. And then, of course, she pulls it out wearing all some kind of protective rubber gear and then peels it off. And then they talk about it more while she immerses it in some other kind of toxic chemical bath. And then she cleans it up with some, oh, and she's made some kind of a, a thing that can squeeze liquid through pipes. And that's pretty cool. So, and they raised $3 million for doing this. And I think it even has an Arduino inside. But anyway, uh, really cool. Um, super neat. But my favorite part was the thing appearing out of the back. I just thought that was the most awesome part of the whole um, the whole thing. Okay, so there's a ton of these hobby FDM printers that are on the on the market, and just to remind you, FDM is fused deposition modeling. It's this printing using a tiny little filament that's squeezed through some kind of an extrusion device. Um, the original kind of one that somebody showed up with one at the club years and years ago. It may have been Walt. <laughs> oh, it was Dave. Okay. And so somebody came with one of these. It was a rep wrap. That's the, kind of the original. This one up here on the top. And most of the hobby 3D printers started like that, and they evolved and uh, into things like the MakerBot and other other products. Um, this, you know, there's a ton of these on the internet. Do some searches, you'll find a million of them. Um, and but I, I have a specific uh, like, and they're not all created equal, obviously. And then we're going to skip to MakerBot. Now they're, you know, a lot of people have their different biases to, as to why they like certain printers. I like the MakerBot. Well, I'll show you why. There's a slide coming up, but. This thing will do, it's an FDM printer, it'll do ABS and PLA. Those are two types of prints. Uh, most of these little cubes that are being handed around are, are printed in ABS. But this, so this is an ABS one. And this really colorful pink one is printed in PLA. And I'm gonna pass them around together so that you can feel what the difference in the texture is. PLA is a very brittle plastic, it's very easy to break. Um, also, another thing too is on the parts that I passed around, don't attempt to test how strong they are by squeezing them or flexing them because they will break. Um, uh, but MakerBot actually even offers a dual color printer. You can print in two colors. Um, it's pretty cool, and it has a lot of you know roots in the open source community. But uh, what happened is this is kind of where they started out. They started out with this one here called the Cupcake on the left, and you can see. Um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, pick and place machine he's got is based on one of the original kind of frames for Cupcake or is it, was it a cup? It was an automaker actually. It was an automaker, okay. So, and it turns out that the, the Cupcake kind of started it all with MakerBot and then there was a lot of other knockoffs and people that made different versions of this. It was a totally open source thing. It plugged into like that communal power of the open source movement on the internet. Everybody loved it. They kind of made the next version, which was this thing called the Thingomatic, or some people call it the TOM. And it was more cool, more features, more capable, more accurate. And Dave Curtis, one of the guys here in the club, who I don't know if he came tonight, I don't think he did. He's the one that kind of got me into this. He owned one of these cupcakes, and they sold it as a kit. You'd buy it, they'd send you a big box of parts, and you'd put it together on your own. And uh, him and his daughter put one together and she painted it all pink and everything. It was really cute. They made like all kinds of dollhouse furniture and stuff on the 3D printer. It came out really awesome. And that's what got me into wanting one of these. And then right about that time, uh, the MakerBot 1 was released, which is this wooden one here on the bottom. That's the printer here on the table. Uh, the MakerBot 1, which is the, sorry, the Replicator 1, this came out a little about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. And um, uh, they have a single and dual extruded version. And then what makes it interesting is the, the MakerBot 1 can print ABS. And one of the big problems with the early cupcakes and those printers was 
the bed that it printed on was not heated. So the first thing the printer tries to do is lay down this, you know, uh, you know, array of plastic to print on, and it doesn't stick to the printing bed. So then it ends up gumming all up, and you end up with this big pile of extruded goop that's all in your printer, and then it doesn't actually work, and then you don't end up with the result that you were hoping for. Um, so the big thing that came with the Replicator 1 when they released it was big build volume, heated platform so you could print ABS all day long, they had a dual extruder version, and it sold for around $1,800. I think that's how much I paid for this one. Then everybody would come around and see my MakerBot that I was so proud of, and they'd say, that thing's a wooden box. How can it print anything accurately? And those are most of my CNC friends that would come around and say, you know, I've got some big piece of iron in my garage, and it hogs out metal all day long, and it's accurate to within a thousandth of an inch. Well, I agree, you know, it's a wooden box. Everyone would expect that the next version, if they made a metal frame, it would be better. Well, it turns out that it wasn't better, uh, and I'll explain why. But there's two additional models, Replicator 2, which is a metal frame. It only prints in PLA. And then they basically created this new one called the Replicator 2X, which just came out earlier this year. And it's just like the Replicator 1, except it has a metal frame, and there's not really any differences other than it's $1,000 more. Okay, so uh, then there was a scandal, which I'll throw the scandal into the main. The original MakerBot Replicator 1 was open source. So everything was open source. All the electronics, all of the CAD drawings, everything. So what happened about six months after they had put the printer out and it was becoming popular, some guy took it and created the Tangibot, which essentially was the Replicator 1 with a brand new name on it, identical from all from open source parts, and ran a Kickstarter to get it going. Well, about this time, MakerBot had taken $10 million worth of venture capital, and they freaked out. And they were like, oh no, we can't have our stuff just being cloned by everybody, so our next version, the Replicator 2, will not be open source anymore. And this created a lot of you know, ire in the, in the open source community on the fact that you know, this caused them to go closed source, the Tangibot. And then there were other printers that came along, like the MBOT, which kind of looks like a hybrid between the original Cupcake and the Replicator. You know, it has a heated build platform, it's made in China, so it's pretty inexpensive. And then there's the Flash Forge Creator, which I'm going to get back to this printer. I really like this printer. This is probably the most viable MakerBot clone on the market. Now, I would not be promoting the purchase of a MakerBot clone had MakerBot not closed source all their stuff because now you can't use your service in. Something breaks, you can go, whoops, you can go uh, make a replacement part or do it because it's open source. MakerBot 2 is closed source. The electronics in it, nobody really knows what the schematic is. Something blows up inside of it. The only way to get it fixed is to send it back to MakerBot. And maybe it'll get fixed quickly, maybe it won't. Their support is very good. MakerBot support's awesome. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'll tell you a story about, about um, uh, my, my robot in a little bit. Then there's the Wan Hao Duplicator. Now this thing is like, like the MakerBot, original MakerBot clone, but on steroids. It's got like every bell and whistle you can imagine. They fixed all the problems in it, and um, it's pretty too. It looks really, really good. The problem is, is that the instructions are in Chinese, and I don't, I don't, I know only like one guy on the net who has one, but he claims it's awesome, right? <laughs> So, this is where I started out a couple years ago, okay? I have this big CNC mill. I can cut out plastic all day long. It's got an automatic tool changer. I bought it from some guy down in Thousand Oaks, and there, my friend Bob Allen, who's not here, he moved away to Nevada, but he was heavy, heavy here in the robot club with us for many years. 
And he he was, you know, he's a good friend because you know you have a good friend when you say, hey, I want to drive to Thousand Oaks with a trailer behind my truck and pick up a 2,000 pound CNC machine and bring it back. Will you help me? And he said, sign me up. So we went down there and got it. I bought this off the guy for like 4,000 bucks. It has a 20,000 RPM liquid cooled spindle. It's totally awesome. Now what you would say to yourself, well, if you got this in your garage, why would you want to be building with 3D printing? This 3D printing stuff is awesome. Like, I can draw something and print it, okay, and walk away. With that, I gotta do half a day worth of setup in order to get ready to cut out my part. And, you know, I'm hopefully I'm cutting out four or five of the same part because then I save the time of having to set it all up again to do the next part. Since I got this, I've touched that twice, okay? In fact, this is eventually going to be for sale, actually. It's coming up. So, okay, so I went from that to this. Now, now I get to tell you my story about the Replicator 2X. So here's my original printer here, and it's heavily modified from the original MakerBot 1. And then I thought, man, the 2X has got to be a $1,000 awesomer or, you know, than the one that I already own. You would think, right? Because it was $1,000 more. So I went on and put my order in. The lead time on the 2X is eight weeks, okay? So it's a lot of waiting. And in fact, when I bought the Replicator 1, the lead time was eight weeks, and Dave Curtis from the parking lot convinced me, he says, you better go place that order right now, because in two weeks from now, you're gonna be sitting there saying to yourself, I should have placed that order two weeks ago. <laughs> so basically, that's what ended up happening. You know, I got, it took me eight weeks to get that one originally two years ago. I've been printing all over the place with it. I did that, signed up, eight weeks later, it comes. And I'm like so excited because I'm like, this has got to be better than the other one. It's got to be faster, you know, better quality, better, every thousand dollars better, right? It is not. <laughs> and, and I'm so angry that it's not, that, that uh, it has all kinds of other quirky issues. I finally learned all the quirky things about the wooden one that this one has a whole different set of quirky things that are totally different. And I was really weirded out by it. And as I owned it for maybe two months, and I was always constantly complaining and saying, if I had it to do over again, I would go buy one of those wooden clones that's just like the MakerBot 1 of the Replicator Duel, and I would mod it all up the same way that I've added my modifications to it, and then it would feel like the same thing. And so I was always complaining about this. Well, uh, there's, uh, I have some friends that work at another company. They, they had a replicator two that broke and they were waiting on parts. And I was constantly sitting there complaining and one day they called me up on the phone and they said, we really need a 3D printer. Will you sell us your replicator two? And I said, absolutely, thank God. <laughs> so they got, what they needed, which is, the, the Replicator 2X is a, is a pretty darn good printer. I mean, it prints well. It doesn't print as well as my heavily modified Replicator 1 Dual, but it does print very well. They got an awesome printer, and what did I do? I turned right around and ordered this thing. Uh, let's see if I can go back. Oh, I can't go back. Oh yeah, I can. I ordered, not the Wan How, I thought about it, the Flashforge Creator which this thing is a, a knockoff of the Replicator 1 Duel, and they fixed all the quirks and the electronics that cause it to catch on fire and things like that sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah, you do hear, if you go online, there is a MakerBot support forum, and you will see posts, my heated bed platform caught on fire, or uh, I went to unplug, and this is, you'll see on my mine, I went to unplug the heated bed platform and I ripped the connector right off the back of the board, which that happened on this one. I'll explain that later if you come by and I'll tell you some good stories. I ordered one of these and I was so excited because I was getting ready to come here tonight and the FedEx guy shows up with an international priority package, but I couldn't believe they sent the international priority because I didn't pay extra for shipping. And it shows up fresh from China. I took it out of the box, it looks awesome. I haven't turned it on yet, but uh, I didn't have time before I came here, but I was like, almost wanted to like blow off coming here just so I could try out my new printer. But I have high hopes for this, and in a few weeks, 
if you see me around, go ask me how it turned out. Because, well, I don't know how it's going to turn out. It could be a good idea or a bad idea. I don't know, maybe I'll be wishing I ordered the Juan Howe duplicator. Uh, let's see. So, why would you want to fiddle around with the MakerBot as opposed to the Juan Howe duplicator or the MBot or a RepRap? or there's millions of other FDM machines in the market. There's another one that's made out of the UK that's called the, the Frog. The Frog, it's got some kind of an amphibious, and the name of an amphibian or something like that. It's an acrylic looking box and it has a really big build area. It looks really sexy when you look at it online. But when you get down to it, if you have a problem with it or something doesn't quite work right, the user forum online has maybe got like 10 people in it, okay? You go on to the MakerBot Google group, there are thousands of people on there and they're posting daily, oh, I did this and it made my printer better, or I made this tweak, or this mod, or this thing. And so what you're really getting when you deal with the MakerBot as opposed to the hundreds of other ones that you can choose from is this enormous community of people. And a lot of them have been around from its open source roots. And, and you can fix it yourself when it breaks, for the most part. Uh, but that's what you're really getting is the open sourceness and the you know and the ability to uh, to do that. So as we already saw, you can draw a 3D thing in a CAD package if you're choosing. You know you could use OpenSCAD like he was uh, like Steve was just showing. You could use KiCad. I guess that's the one that Wayne likes these days. Um, there's a, oh that one is okay. I'm sorry. There's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of ones that are out there. You could use Google SketchUp. That's another free one. Um, and then you can get we show it the little package you load it into. Okay, but then you gotta modify the heck out of it because that's all half the fun is to turn it into a lifestyle, right? So uh, mine has got extruder upgrades. If you enclose the build area while it's going, it turns out that when you're printing an ABS, if little breezes blow across your building area, they make the plastic crack or it doesn't stick to the build platform, it lifts up slightly, you end up with this little peel on the edge. You'll see one of the cubes is being passed around, peeled while it was printing, and it's got a really rounded looking corner on the edge, and it was because it peeled while it was going. Um, you know, you get the open source firmware. Uh, other ones are, like the open source firmware by far is the best upgrade, as well as the aluminum build arms. These little arms right here that hold the build platform are made out of plastic, and they're underneath a piece of aluminum that's heating up to 230C. Okay, what do you think happens to the plastic over time? It slowly bends and warps and gets strangely shaped. So you're constantly having to level the print bed every single time you want to print. There's a guy on the forum. I don't know his real name, his forum name is Bottleworks, okay? And this guy has a CNC machine in his garage and he started cutting out aluminum arms for the thing. And he says, you pay probably a hundred bucks, I'll send you some aluminum build plate arms. I did. It was like the most awesome upgrade ever. And I've got them on mine here. It's, it's awesome. I would say that's the best upgrade. If you own a MakerBot, get the aluminum build arms. You will never have to level your platform up again unless you bring your robot to an HBRC meeting and you travel with it. Then you'll have to level it when you get there and when you get home. But I haven't had to level my build platform more than once every two weeks printing all the time after I got the aluminum arms. Uh, another item that uh, is a common thing is you print out a little plastic holder for a dial indicator and you can run it across your print bed and make sure that it's leveled within a thousandth of an inch. That's another common thing. People go, well, I can't get my build platform level. Well, go online, print out, a, you know, download a part like this, print it out, stick a dial indicator in it, now you have a perfect print bed leveling thing. So that's one thing I like about this whole community as well, is that you can download parts from the internet, print them out on your printer to solve problems with your printer, right? So that's really cool. Uh, then, now, now here's the real meat, right? You don't just want a 3D printer to print 3D things, although, you know, it's kind of cool to, you know, print doll furniture or print some skateboard ramps for my daughter's finger skateboard thing. That was kind of cool. But, you know, this is a common problem. The most common problem when you're building a robot, and this is the question that gets asked all the time, and has also caused more people in this club to get into CNC machining, is this constant problem of, I've got a motor, 
and I want to attach it to some kind of a drivetrain. And I can tell you, I'm sure all of you who have built a robot have had this problem. You've got some motor in your hand, and you're like, how do I hook it to a drivetrain? This, you draw it, you print it out. 20 minutes later, your motor is hooked to your drivetrain. In this case, there's the drivetrain. You can see I printed out a little incremental encoder wheel here that runs through an encoder and a little encoder holder made out of plastic. All of these were printed parts. It took me less than an afternoon to print all these. Design them up, print them out, solve the problem. If I was doing this on CNC machining, it would have taken me a couple of days to make all those parts. It took me an afternoon. So that's the important part about it. And then you go all the way. You print a 3D printed robot. So in this case, this is a smartphone robot that like has a little app that runs on the phone. It's cute, it's fun, it chases colored blocks around, which you can see I've got lots of colored blocks, so it likes that. Um, but every part on this robot, other than the treads, was 3D printed, uh, you know, all the plastic. So people say, well, how accurate can this thing be? Well, it can be really accurate. The servo horns on those servos, the little splines, are 3D printed into the actual servo horn. So those little tiny little splines, they're printed in there, or you shove right onto the servo. I don't have to have a special thing. It actually works. And uh, you can see, you know, I hear somebody exercising it over there. Uh, I can hear somebody, yes, yeah, she's got it. She's been exercising the servo arms. And, you know, all these little pieces were all 3D printed and they all work fine. So, that's kind of the end of my talk. But there's lots of expensive ways to 3D print. We saw them. You can, you've seen all these really cool parts that are expensive. But there are lots of inexpensive alternatives that you can pursue. And here's the most important part of the whole talk. The consumables are what gets you in the pocketbook. If you go and you buy the $200,000 object printer, the consumable item, the stuff you put in there that prints out, it's ridiculously expensive. And it turns out that some of the 3D printer makers are trying to make it so that you can only buy a cartridge from them that prints into it because they don't want to, they can, then they can practically give you the printer and then sell you all of the consumables and make all their money like HP did where they gave away the printer practically and then sold you the ink at some ridiculous price. So that is exactly the kind of mindset that the 3D printer people are trying to move to. And uh, I can buy, for this printer, a one kilogram spool of filament for 35 bucks. So an average part, like one of these, costs pennies to print. Okay, and as opposed to going to, um, you know, Shapeways or something, something this size would cost me a couple of dollars, a few dollars, whatever. Okay, questions? What? Okay, see, there you go, 20 bucks in the back. Okay, I want, uh, for q and I want to hand out the microphone. So raise your hand and we'll get the microphones to talk. So we're going to do Dillo first, and I'm going to do you. We're going to just you know, tag team these, these microphones, okay? Let's, let's have a question and or a couple of comments. Uh, one on the consumables. Um, having recently also had some experience printing out robot parts uh, uh, 3D printer, there is a reason why the software, uh, the, the, the slicing software, uh, will give you an gives you an estimate of the cost. Uh, so when you go to uh, when you have your mod and you go to take it into the CAD, to the CAM software to turn it into G code. Um, at least the MakerBot software will give you an estimate of how much your part will cost, um, and it will tell you, like, you know, this thing with this volume of this size will cost two dollars and thirty-seven cents, and this will cost seventeen cents. So yes, that's the consumable. There's a reason, you know, why, and this is like the first software I've ever run into that will give you an estimate of the cost of your thing. Right. Um, it's cool. Sorry. Well, they also give you time estimates too. But time right. estimates I've seen like on rendering software for 20 some odd years. And you always know that like when you're rendering something in 3D, it'll take two days anyways. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you're doing it on an Amiga in the early 90s or you're doing on, you know, a, a multi-core GPU now. It's always going to take two 
days uh, because complexity scales up. Uh, the other thing is, is have you seen the uh, uh, the Type A machine? No, I've heard a lot about it, but I haven't okay, actually. Okay, so seen I can tell you about that. I printed out my uh, cable cleats using the Type A at Tech Shop SF. I like it. The the one it's very MakerBot like. The one thing they have. Um, is they have a huge build platform. It's right. about twice as tall as that. So yeah. they're printing out propellers that are like like literally this big. Wow. Um, it's it's huge. Cool. Um, and it's what final resolution, but you know, you can argue that. Sure. It added infinite. <laughs> That's basically just a couple comments. Cool. Uh, you had said when you first get these uh, 3D printers, that there's always some problem. They don't actually run right out of the box. Um, what kind of problems do you ex did you experience with these? Okay, so, so the most common problems are that you see on the mailing list are uh, they, go the, they go to print the first time, and the print doesn't stick to the print bed. It ends up just kind of squeezing some stuff out and then moving it around the platform without sticking. It turns out that the platform that you print on needs to be level, and it the starting point that the nozzle comes down to place that first layer needs to be within around 0.1 millimeters or 100 or you know 10 micron roughly to you know get it down. So it's squeezing the initial first piece of extruded material out like a toothpaste pressed up against your hand, right? And it turns out that adjusting the level of the bed and getting it perfectly level and perfectly that nozzle height away to get started, and until you figure out how to do that, it can be very frustrating and very time consuming. And so a lot of more than half of the posts are, I can't get it to stick, and or I can't get my print bed level, uh, or uh, my print peels up off of the print bed after it's been going for a while. And, and it turns out that the, the solution to print bed peeling is to clean the print bed regularly with like a some acetone or something that makes it very clean so that the surface it's going down on is just pristine. Having the bed perfectly level, which is solvable by printing out one of these, and, uh, and then having the other problem is the issue of airflow. If you're printing in ABS, airflow is a real problem. If you're printing in PLA, airflow is a blessing because PLA tends to cool slower and you want it to cool fast. And so the Replicator 2 actually has an extra fan in it for printing PLA that blows down onto the printing surface to try to cool the plastic as it comes out. And so I would say that those are the, the biggest things of warped prints, prints not sticking, um, you know, nozzle jams, people will go buy aftermarket filament on the market, you know, they'll buy the $20 spool of ABS. And it, and it won't be uniformly thick. So there'll be like a little thick section in it, and it'll actually go into the print head and get stuck, and then you can't get it out. Um, stuff like that, all kinds of weird little things that the average consumer, you want it to be like, like a printer you go buy at Fry's. You, you buy a printer and you put it on your computer and you, you hit print and it comes out. And you, know, you shouldn't have to diddle around with it for, some people have diddled around with their printers for days or weeks and never gotten it to work right. And then they post all this angry stuff on the Google group saying, I'm sending it back, I hate it, it's the most awful thing. I, it was, you know, and they're, what they're not realizing is, by buying that thing, they're making a lifestyle choice, <laughs> okay? And a lot of people don't want it to be a lifestyle choice. For me, I'm really into it because, you know, these things are cheap and I can have a couple of them and I can make robot parts all day long and it's just, if I have it set up right, it's print and forget. I can just go in the other room and it, I smell for smoke. If it doesn't catch on fire, I'm, I'm good. But other than that, you know, it's pretty much set and forget, and I feel pretty good. I would never leave it unattended, though, for a long period of time. There's a lot of guys that talk about printing overnight, like unattended. I would never do that. I mean, I've heard too many stories of like, oh, there was a, it was printing and there was a pop. And all of a sudden, I saw smoke coming out of the back of it. 
that. And it turns out some of the early units had bad power supplies and stuff, and there wasn't a lot of thorough testing, and they would just randomly break or catch on fire or you know whatever. So. Um. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Well, right now I'm trying to make a, a linkage for a servo. Yeah. And I'm kind of wondering how you how you cat up uh, the connector for the servo. So so the way that you do it is. You, oh, this is a really important point that I didn't mention through the whole thing. The awesome part about having penny consumables is you can print over and over and over and over again until you get it right. And this is the problem with a service bureau. You spend 30 bucks, you send your thing off, you get it back, oh shoot, it's not the right tolerance, it's not the right size, it doesn't just quite fit. Now I gotta spend another 35 bucks, wait another two weeks to get it, right? With this thing, uh, I actually had a, an intern that was at our company this last summer who was a SolidWorks genius, he was a high school kid, and I had him catting up a lot of parts for that robot. And he would print it out, and it didn't, he had to get press fitted parts on it, or press fit together, so they've gotta be just dead on. And, the MakerBot cannot print a perfectly round circle. It's slightly oblonged. It usually has some surface defects in it. So making two things that you print out and you shove together where they fit perfectly takes lots of trial and error. This is how you do your problem with the spline. You basically take a guess at the spline and draw it and try it and print it. When it doesn't work, you throw it away, and you change it, and you do it over and over and over again, and you eventually get it. And like, uh, in the case of the high school kid, I invented this thing called the box of shame. Okay, and it's like this big cardboard box, it says box of shame on the side, and it is filled with dozens of failed prints, okay, or things that weren't just quite the right size, or I didn't fit together. I actually thought about bringing it just for fun, because there's lots of little, weird knickknacks and stuff in there in the box of shame. But you know, every time you, you pull something off, it didn't work, oh, it's into the box of shame. And there's another item too that, again, Dave Curtis has been promoting. There was a Kickstarter for this thing that's called the Philistruder, that is this thing that can make filament that you can put into this by like chopping up old milk jugs and then putting it into this thing that looks kind of like a big meat grinder, okay? And then it pushes that chunks of chopped up milk jugs through a heating element and then out an extruder and it creates filament. And uh, so what I'm hoping is someday I'm going to take the box of shame and <laughs> pump it into one of these things and then make new filament. It'll be very multicolored and strange because it has lots of different colors of stuff being chopped up and shoved in there. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question about the quality uh, safety part of the consumable items. So, are there any material which are like food grade or you know uh, yeah, yeah. So, safe for the skin or? So, so PLA, they sell food grade PLA filament that you can print with. So you can literally print containers and things you can store food in and stuff, and it's not toxic. Um, there are people, there's a big discussion on the list about the fumes that this thing actually emits when it's extruding ABS plastic and things like that. And there's a lot of discussion about that going on and about people wearing respirator masks and all kinds of strange things to try to be worried about the particles it emits. You know, I don't know, you only live once, so I'm really into my 3D printer, so I'm not getting rid of it because I breathe bad particles, but other than that. So any of these are like super dangerous if Say the parts catches fire, or the smoke is like super poisonous. No. Oh yeah, I mean they are. Again, if the part caught fire, yes. But in these cases, the parts never what catch catches fire. It's always just the robot itself. You know, the electronics catch on fire, or because I mean again, it's a wooden printer, right? Well, would you trust a wooden printer with a bunch of hot electronics in it? Because it's not during the printing. Like, let's say if I prepare an electronic project box or something, you know, and then some electronic part catches fire. Oh, oh, project I see. Project box. Well, again, most of the toys on the market that you just buy at the toy store, they are molded out of ABS plastic. Okay, so these are plastics that are used in everyday products all over the place already. So they're not uncommon, they're not strange. Now, in the case of the UV cure resin stuff, 
in some cases, we really don't know what's actually in there. So maybe there, I, I don't know. You know, I know that I know that like on the object, one of the funny stories that I was heard, I guess you guys told it, was there's when it's done printing, okay, after a while, it has this like waste bag of like leftover material that when that didn't that wasn't part of your part when it printed it. And they call it, uh, somebody was called it the goo bag, right? So it's like this bag of waste product. And it's UV cure material that was left over as waste product when you were done printing. Now, if you go to them, you say, well, what do you do with this stuff? It's like toxic waste. And they're like, well, what you do is you go out into the parking lot and you spread out a tarp and you kind of pour the goo bag out onto the tarp and let it cure in the sun. And then it's harmless and you can throw it away, right? <laughs> so I can just imagine going out behind my business with a tarp, with a respirator mask on, pouring some strangely colored liquid onto a tarp, and backing away so that the UV rays can cure it. You know, I can just imagine what the city would do to me. <laughs> yeah. And this is, this is the reason why Willa Barrage bought the project instead of the object, because it didn't have the goo bag. Well, it actually does, but it automatically cartons it. Oh, it automatically cartons it. It, it. it actually goes but into the UV. Who gets it? Is it a toxic waste place? Who picks it up? Oh, we just put it in the trash. Some guy. <laughs> Some guy shows up to take it away. So, yeah. I want to add one thing, which is that the, a lot of the stuff about the toxic part and the heated bill platform and all that kind of stuff is related to ABS. Okay. So if you if you do print in PLA, you don't have to have the heated bill platform. And PLA is a, a corn fried uh, material. So it's it, that's why it's not as toxic. It doesn't smell as bad. Uh, we've got a printer, Andrew runs his printer in the house. So it, you know, it, it's not as, as big of a deal as that. It isn't, true. Thanks. Yeah. Another comment about the, the PLA. You actually smell it. It actually smells vaguely sweet. Um, oh, the PLA. The PLA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, it's and, corn yeah. based. Yeah. And, and just in terms of like toxic fumes and stuff like that, I just wanted to, just, you know, having been around this stuff recently, I just wanted to say I love the smell of long chain polycyclic aromas in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we hear that? It? Yeah, somebody else has the microphone. You have to point it at your mouth or we can't hear you. All right. Um, it strikes me that you could possibly use computer vision techniques to improve on um, placing the nozzle and sure. overcoming some reliability problems. Has anyone thought of you, doing that? You probably could, but nobody's done it, probably just because of the cost issues and whatever. People are trying to make these things dirt cheap. And uh, yeah, I agree. And then there's, there's the mechanical thing. You would think the metal version of this thing would print better than a wood one. Yeah. It just seems so obvious that that would be the case, but it doesn't. And that just, it just wrecks my melon like every day thinking about that. You know, it's like a lot of things that seem like they would be common sense, just for some reason don't work out that way in the case of this stuff. But. Okay. So, stupid question, man. When you go to one of these services, can you get this lost wax casting done in for stainless steel? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, there's tons of places that will print for lost wax casting. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of people that are doing jewelry design and sending it to these places, and they're printing, they're printing wax molds for you, and then you you can bring them back and either do them yourself on your own, you know, uh, casting device, or there are other bureaus that will actually do it for you. So uh, there's a ton of people doing jewelry, doing this kind of stuff. And um, Shapeways actually has an online marketplace where people upload their, their designs for jewelry and things like that. And people can come to the website and literally order the jewelry item and they'll print it out in the metal of their choice and send it to them. So it's kind of cool. And then they send you a check. Right, they send you a check or royalty. They'll actually send you a royalty for your design that you sell through their website. Both Shapeways and Pinoco have a setup like that, um, where they're encouraging people to in, make cool things and then sell them to others using their bureau or printing technology. Yeah. Anything else? Move on to. Okay, we're going to be.
Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you. Thank you.